that baby is raised by a mom that loves Jesus. That baby comes to know Jesus. That baby becomes a preacher or a pastor or whatever yeah. and leads people to the Lord. Yeah. The family is impacted because they see the impact that the gospel had on their daughter or their granddaughter or you know cousin or whatever. So many people that as a ripple effect from what you, Vicky, have been involved in, what you guys who are listening, what you've been involved in, that ripple effect and so many lives that are touched and saved, so many souls that were saved that you won't find out about until you stand before the Lord. I am yours, I am yours, I am yours, send me, Lord. I am yours, I am yours, I am yours. Welcome to the Gospel Center Pro Life Podcast, a podcast designed to equip, encourage, and challenge you in pro life ministry, and always with a focus on the gospel. Stay tuned. I felt your passion touched your heart. Welcome back to the Gospel-Centered Pro-Life Podcast. Appreciate you guys joining us. I am joined, I'm Daniel Parks, and I'm joined by Vicki Kassiorg. Say hey, Vicki. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. Yeah, it is good to be here. And uh, I serve as the West Coast Regional Shepherd for Love Life, which means I oversee all of our efforts on the West Coast, and also help oversee our sidewalk outreach ministry all across the nation. We speak into the sidewalk ministries that are happening in our various cities I do that as well as Vicki. Vicki is our Sidewalk Outreach Training Director, so she's involved in training and equipping folks and um, just a, a real blessing to the body of Christ and helping people really be as effective as possible on the sidewalk. And that's why we record these podcasts. Really, we focus on the sidewalk ministry. We we do other topics and things, and I think this topic today will be a help, not just for this, the Sidewalk Outreach Ministry, but for any ministry, actually, that you're involved in. Um, but before we jump into our subject, just want to let you guys know we are recording remotely. So if there's some little sound glitches or something, we apologize for that. We try to bring as good a quality as we can. And uh, we want to do that to bless you guys so that you can, you're can you not distracted <laughs> and you can take in the content. Um, but yeah, did want to mention that and also mention that we'll leave our email addresses at the end of this episode. We'll give you guys our email addresses and we'd love for you guys to reach out to us. We always encourage you to reach out with questions, uh, comments, encouragements, and uh, you know maybe suggestions for some future episodes. A lot of our episodes come from people asking questions and suggesting that maybe we should do an episode about this or that subject. And so um, with that, Vicki, what is our subject? It is really a question that I think does not at all only apply to sidewalk counseling, but to the Christian life. Yeah, and okay. and that the general title is is it all worth it? Okay. Will it be worth it? Um and I recently listened to a fantastic podcast by John Piper which was titled Will it be worth it? I really recommend okay. that everyone listen to it. It was it was so good for people in ministry. He was specifically talking about global mission work. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, whenever I read the Bible or listen to a podcast, really, I, I, I almost always apply it to our work on the sidewalk. And so that's what this article is, is taking some of the principles that John Piper brought up in that excellent podcast and applying them to our, our work as sidewalk um, counselors, sidewalk outreach people. And, um, and where he started really resonated with me on um, on the obstacles that we hear raised by people who we are trying to encourage to become sidewalk outreach members yeah or who have been doing it a while even there are some things that that we just hear all the time yeah. especially yeah. before they start yeah uh, coming up well on. I think so his article or his his episode was Will it be worth it? Right. Um, our article is, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. <laughs> so we're making a, we're not asking a question. We're making a declaration. It will be yeah. worth it. And sometimes in ministry, especially in a ministry as difficult as this, you need to say to yourself, it will be worth it. It will be worth it. That's and, really uh, and, and confess that. I mean, that's, that's what I do. Um, you know, just speaking as a father, right? Sometimes my children frustrate me. 
Mm-hmm. And I have to I have to give sometimes some positive confession. Children are a blessing from the Lord. I have to right. confess what Psalm 127 <laughs> says. I don't always feel like it, um, but I'm trying to convince myself of the truth of what God's Word says. And in the same token here, it may not always feel like it's going to be worth it when we struggle, when we uh, face opposition and challenges and all that stuff. But we know, according to the word of God, it will be worth it, right? Yeah. It'll all yeah. be worth it. All the sacrifices, all that we pour out, all the time, uh, talent and treasures that we pour out, it'll be worth it. It will be. And we. I hope by the end of the article or the podcast that um, everyone will be convinced of that, because I think we do e- easily. We can support yeah. that that through God, it, it definitely will be worth it. Yeah. So some of the common obstacles. Okay. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I'm working These are way. common obstacles to us. These are common obstacles voiced or thought to why uh, it will not be worth it, why you okay. should not bother with missionary work. And yeah. so for us, why you should not bother with sidewalk counseling. Yeah. So a common obstacle um, that you have listed here in some bullet points with mm-hmm. uh, within the article, the first one is I'm not worthy. Right. Um, I'm not called is the next one. I'm not able it's not my job. <laughs> I don't want to deal with the culture war and with political and social change. The end times are bleak and it's futile in the face of hard hearts. Uh, the world is unfixable. So why bother? And then the last one you have here, is it really worth it to give up so much earthly comfort and face so much persecution? I- I'll just speak, first of all, mm-hmm. to that first point. I'm not worthy. So as you're called into ministry, or you feel a calling into ministry. Or you ponder the fact or the idea that you should be doing this ministry or that ministry. In particular, we're talking about sidewalk outreach ministry. This notion of I'm not worthy might come to the forefront of your mind. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I will say, actually, is I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not worthy. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of the point. Mm-hmm. And I hear in a lot of Christian circles in these days, uh, people saying, and I've even heard messages that, you know, we need to understand that you're worthy. And even people encouraging other believers that you're worthy. Um, no, actually, you're not. The Bible says, and this is in the Revelation, there is none found worthy. This is as John the Revelator was weeping because no one was found to open the scroll or break the seven seals. This is in John chapter, or, I'm sorry, uh, Revelation chapter five. And uh, the Bible says that none was found worthy in heaven or on the earth, right? And so the reality is that none are worthy, and that's kind of the point. We're not worthy of the love of God. We're not worthy of mercy. We're worthy of hell, right, and separation from God. However, in Christ, we are made worthy, right, because he is the worthy one. If we're in him, we get what he gets. And so we're not worthy in our own flesh. No one is, and no one ever can be. Jesus Christ is worthy, we put our trust in him and we, his worthiness, just like his righteousness is imputed to us. Now, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And we always need to understand that, that anything that we get, any favor that we get, mercy that we get, love that we get from the father comes through Jesus Christ, through his worthiness and through his sacrifice. And so I, I wanted to mention that. Yeah. And I think I, those are all such good points. And, and that applies to almost all of these objections. That um, yeah, you're right. You're you're not able, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. For the same reason, no, you're not. But yeah, Christ if you become you. able and you can do a thing apart from Jesus, then it's not really ministry, right? Right. You can call it something else, but it's not ministry. Jesus said in John chapter 15 that apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I for myself. I've gotten to a a position in my life where it's like, yeah, apart from you, I can do nothing. And apart from you, Lord, I don't want to do anything, right? I don't want to do anything that's apart from you because I know my own frailties, my own weakness, my own lack of wisdom. And so, yeah, we don't need to, to find a position of ourselves in ourselves where we're worthy or where we're able Uh, Our position is one of surrender and God gives us abilities. That doesn't mean we become these sort of like, (laughs) you know, mute and um, sort of passive people. No, we're very much active when we realize our inabilities and surrender to God's ability working through us. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, I'm not called, again, you know, well, I think everyone's called to protect the innocent, the vulnerable. Yeah. Um, so when I, when we're thinking about sidewalk ministry outside of abortion centers, maybe you're not called specifically to be on the sidewalk. Maybe not. I am coming yeah. to be a little bit less dogmatic about that, but you're certainly called in some way to yeah, impact um, this whole abortion holocaust. You, you, yeah. We all are called to protect those innocent little babies. We cannot, we cannot be silent on, yeah, on that yeah. issue. Uh, it's not my job. It's along the same things, you know. Um, right. uh, it, well, it is. <laughs> Our job before the Lord is to do everything that um, we are biblically called to do. And as a group, we are all called to speak righteously. We are all called not to be silent in the face of evil. Um, we are all called to judge righteously it, with yeah. the righteousness of Christ within us, and we are called to um, love our neighbor as ourself, and those little babies are our neighbors. So there, there's an element that we're called and that it is all of our jobs. And if we don't do it, this is a question I love to ask uh, myself. If I don't do it, who will? Yeah, um, yeah. Because too many people say, well, I can't do it, but I'm glad you're doing it. Right, um, yeah. Well, what if I wasn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so that's not where we're going to focus because I, th- I think those are easily easily dismantled those those sure. objections. But um, the cultural war thing um, is uh, is where a lot of people want to focus their efforts. They want to focus on social change or politics um, to evoke change. None of that is bad. Don't hear sure. what I'm not saying. I'm not saying politics or social change or humanitarian efforts are bad. They're all good, but to say, this is where I need to focus. I want to deal with that. Um, and, um, and therefore, I'm, I'm not going to deal with the um, gospel-centered uh, ministry uh, opposing abortion or yeah. trying to, um, to end abortion through gospel-centered means. Um, there is a really interesting research, which I had never heard of, um, that, that John Piper brings up, because if someone's true heart is saying, we, we want to evoke social change, we want to transform the culture, which of course we do, our, yeah, we do in our, in our ministry, well then what has shown the greatest effect in cultural transformation? Great question, because if yeah. there's if we know the answer to that, isn't that where we should put our efforts? And interestingly enough, um, the there's a, a study by Robert Woodbury, or he wrote the article about 10 years ago, um, okay. and it was for the American Political Science Review. It was titled The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy. And um, he said that the research, and he apparently cited um, a bunch of research that found the single largest factor in ensuring the health of nations. And where the nations were healthiest was where missionaries had, uh, had ministered. Yeah. And what was extremely interesting, some of the things that were the result of missionaries going to these um, you know, impoverished, uh, culturally backwards, whatever, um, regions of the world, the places where they impacted them, there, there was greater economic development, better health, lower infant mortality, lower corruption, greater literacy, and higher educational attainment. But what was really interesting um, was that it was not just any missionary um, effort that promoted yeah. the change. He said the highest impact was through what they called conversionary Protestants. Okay. And what they meant is that these were missionaries who focused not at all on the social or cultural issues, but on the life-changing message of the gospel, yeah. encouraging people to follow Jesus to save their so souls from perishing. Basically, evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians. And and even this, and I have no idea why they made this distinction, but this was interesting. The effects of Catholic groups, and they said specifically prior to 1960, I don't know why that, but the effects of Catholic groups or government-appointed religious groups did not have this impact at all. It was okay. only the conversionary Protestants 
that had this significant impact on the culture. In other words, the gospel works. Yeah. It, when, yeah. when you change hearts, you change a culture. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so, yeah, I mean, something that comes to mind for me, just a couple of things that come to mind for me, and I've had these conversations with pro boards, you know, they talk about, you know, us being white Christian nationalists or something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, we want to <laughs> take over the world or right. you know, what, whatever that kind of garbage is. And, you know, I share some of the history. One of the questions I'll ask um, for some of these atheist pro boards is, can you name for me five organizations that help people? Right. And if they name five organizations that will help people, I said, I guarantee you of the five that you name, and if they name them, I'll point out the ones that they name, uh, almost all of them would be rooted in Christianity. You know, you get like the Red Cross, uh, every hospital that exists on the face of the planet pretty much is a Baptist, Methodist, <laughs> Presbyterian hospital we have around here in Charlotte, right? Um, I think of uh, practice like foot binding. You ever heard of that practice yeah. where young ladies' feet were bound up? This is a Chinese practice. And they would be disabled. They couldn't walk. I mean, yeah, they would yeah, have because the, the men found them deformed. to be more attractive if their feet were small and yeah. weird practice. Well, Christian missionaries are the are the folks that got that practice ultimately mm-hmm. banned, right? Because that was that was a marring of the image of God. Yeah. Um in India there was a ritual, I think it's called sati or something like that. Um, where essentially if a husband dies and the widow is left, they burn the widow alive on the husband's uh, funeral pyre or whatever they call it. And it's Christians that actually got that practice um, banned. And ultimately those two things are obsolete. It's because Christians came in and preached the gospel. People got saved. They realized that these practices are, are rooted in demonic behavior and they mar the image of God and, they're against what the scripture teaches and these practices were banned. And so, you know, if you want to call that Christian nationalism or whatever you want to call it, I, to me, I think that was a positive change that the gospel made in the same way. If you think of Christianity in the very beginning, it was the Christians that were rescuing the kids that were left for exposure, right? In, in Roman culture, a father could decide a baby in his house was born that he didn't want that baby because it was a girl that mostly that's the case. And so they would leave her out on a dung heap to die. And it's Christians that would snatch those babies in the night and uh, take them and and raise them. And so Christianity has been a force for good, but not just humanitarian good um, for the spreading of the gospel. And the spreading of the gospel brings humanitarian good, right? Jesus shows the ultimate value of human beings by coming and dying on a cross for our sins. And so, yeah, I mean, Christianity establishes the value of human life and talk about a culture war, like preaching the gospel is countercultural. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, humanitarian efforts are good. Political efforts can be good as long as they're rooted in the gospel and a desire to, to see God glorified. But, um, yeah, we, we talked about, we did a podcast, um, it's been a while, called The Good is Always the Enemy of the Best. You remember that? Mm-hmm. And this is kind of that same thought, right? Um, maybe for somebody, the best is to fight the culture of war on a political level. Maybe that's the best for them. But you can get distracted with all kinds of things. I know people that get involved in sidewalk ministry, they're very passionate about it. But then they get pulled in all kinds of other, other directions doing other things. And I think what we're saying here is we need to focus on the gospel and what we do um, should spring out of that. Exactly. And, uh, you know, one of the points that you made is one of the summaries of the article is that, in a sense, the wonderful social benefits did occur, but they were really an unintended consequence. A good one. But they were unintended. That was not the goal. The goal was to expose sin, renounce false beliefs, lead to repentance, proclaim the truth of Jesus' death and resurrection to pay the penalty for sin, and rescue souls from the wrath of God. And that's yeah. what caused the cultural change. Because, yeah. and I think you hit the nail on the cross. <laughs> right? Okay. Right. Exactly. Because it expo- it helped our hearts, human hearts, to recognize the value of each other from a God-centered perspective point of view. And of course, then that would extend to um, loving others um, economically, socially in a whole new way um, in places where that was not the case. So so the second um, uh, big obstacle raised 
that John Piper addressed was that because the end times are coming, we don't know when. He, yeah. he uh, who knows? Are we in them? I think we are, but there's a lot of people that say, no, it's going to be so much worse. Well, we're you can't closer believe it. to the end than, <laughs> than we Paul were was when he wrote what he wrote, you know, almost 2,000 years true. ago, right? This is true. So as the end times approach, um, we are warned of lawlessness growing hard, growing yeah. harder hearts, growing rebellion to the Lord, disasters, wars, the picture's bleak. I will sure. tell you, when I, ju- you know, this recent horrific earthquakes in Syria and Turkey that has now taken almost 20,000 lives, I think is what they said. Just uh, just unimaginable horror and destruction. I was thinking, okay, earthquakes. I mean, there are, there, it just really feels like um, disasters are escalating. Yeah. And, and I know that what we're seeing this week, we saw two days out at the one abortion center, one of three in, in Charlotte, over 100 babies killed wow, in That's on heavy. two separate days. And and yeah. um, Wednesday, normally our lightest day, almost 70. There, Something's going on. Something's going on. It, it, it does appear that everything is growing harder. And I can, I can assuredly tell you, as a sidewalk um, outreach person, our work is growing more difficult. It just yeah. really does feel that way, that yeah. it is harder and harder to reach these women um, because of so many things. So the obstacle is um, basically, why bother? The world is unfixable. Yeah. These these hearts are hard. God will take care of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he'll 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 make sure they all repent in turn and and are punished. Justice will come. Why bother with this unfixable? situation. Yeah. Yeah. My answer to that is there's always hope that the Lord will send revival, that he will send a a wave of the Holy Spirit bringing people to know him before the last days, before the um, for the trumpet sounds. I want people to come to know Jesus. I don't want people to end up in hell. Right. I don't want this world to end up um, under the judgment of God. It's ultimately under the judgment of God and will experience um, the wrath of God, like God's gonna at one point say, I'm done with this. We know the Bible talks about the elements will melt with fervent heat. Like God's going to judge this world. That's for sure. Um, but I don't know when that is. And my job is to proclaim the gospel. My job is to bring as many people into the family of God as possible. Um, if I just throw up my hands and say, Oh, it's all going to burn anyway. That's, that's spiritual negligence, right? And that's disobedience to the Great Commission. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples, you know, teaching them to obey all things that I command you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's that's the commission that we're given. Yeah. He doesn't say, do that until you're sure, like, the couple in the last couple of days are, <laughs> are upon you, then you can kind of quit. Right? No, we're supposed to, you know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Will we be faithful? What are we supposed to be faithful with? The Great Commission, making disciples, proclaiming the gospel. So yeah. we don't, we can't give ourselves the allowance of it's all going to burn anyway. Right. Because that's just not a biblical mindset, right? Yeah. It's not the mindset of a follower of Jesus. A great passage is Matthew 24. Um, and let's see, 4 to 6 and 9 to 14. Do you have that there, Daniel? Yeah, I've got it's it Matthew, in the article. I, the, that's a, a a really good passage that I I believe is a strong rebuke to the yeah. kind of thinking that we should just throw in the towel because um because there's been such difficult um challenges. Yeah. You want to read that those sure uh, yeah uh, yeah those verses. And Jesus answered and said to them, "Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled." For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Because because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved." And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. 
Yeah, awesome. And so, you know, kind of the the takeaways, um, and I'm pulling this right from that passage, do not be deceived, do not be troubled, do not lose heart in the face of wars and destruction. You will face persecution. Lawlessness and cold hearts will abound. But, and this is the most important point, we must endure to the end. Not two days before the end, like you said. Uh, We must endure to the end. And one of the points he made that I, I thought was just such a great inspiration is in this terrible end times, all these calamities increasing. Um, who is it that's going to endure to the end? And think about it. The ones that endure to the end, that's a crowd I want to be a part of. Yeah. Those are going to be the on fire, martyr willing, red hot for the Lord Christians, ready to give up all for the sake yeah. of Christ. Yeah. Can you imagine being a part of that group? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, um, that's where we want to be. Will we have the right. courage, the strength, I want whatever? To want to be, I want to want to be a part of that group. But <laughs> I like on fire, but martyr willing. Right? Uh, yeah. <sighs> but, oh, man, painful. what a, what a crowd of people to be to be with. And yeah, imagine no to be in that group as you stand before the Lord. Um, yeah. So um, the, the final obstacle voiced and the crux of this whole thing is, is it worth it? Is yeah. it worth it? And we already said yes. <laughs> yeah. It is worth it. And in this I, I mean, don't know if let me let me say this. Uh-huh. Maybe we reframe it. Mm-hmm. Not is it worth it, mm-hmm. but is he worth it? Oh is beautiful. Jesus Ooh, I worth wish it? I'd is he worth the sacrifices? Is, <laughs> is he, he worth, worth us it? pouring out our time? Is he worth us inconveniencing ourselves? Is he worth us you know suffering shame, you know, and, and rejection and all the things that we might suffer? And the answer to that is yes, he is the son of God. He is the one who overcame death. He's the one who, and this is in Revelation, also he says he is the one who um, died and yet now is risen forevermore. And he holds the keys of death and hell. He is the one who was worthy. Yeah. All the elders, the angels, the elders, the four living creatures in the book of Revelation, they all bow down before him. They say, worthy, worthy, worthy are you, O Lord. Yeah. And so, yes, he's worth it. He's worth it. He's worthy. He is. And so I'm going to go quickly through, at the end of this article, we listed eight um, scripture, but also summary. And I, I won't read all of the scripture, but the summaries of the eight eight reasons, there are way more than those eight, but let's start with eight reasons why it's worth it. And the first, whatever's lost for the sake of Christ, we're promised, will return a hundredfold. Yeah. What we've lost and and the verse I I won't recite it but it's Matthew 13:23 is one of the verses that that supports that. Number 2, life is short but a vapor, but God's yeah. pleasures are forevermore. Yeah. It is it is through Psalm 16:11, your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Yeah. So you're giving up the temporal sometimes, no doubt. There are things that you are going to miss out on and that are going to be hard in the short term, but eternity is forever. (laughs) Yeah, it sure is. And those pleasures will be forever with God. Um, Number three, as you're feeling lonely, ill-equipped, struggling through sometimes horrific um, conditions, though I'll forget and forsake you, Christ never will. Yeah. Um, Hebrews 13, three. Uh, five is a great one. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. Amen. I mean, Jesus told his disciples, he says, in this world, you will have tribulation, but take joy. I have overcome the world. Yeah. Uh, he says, as within the Great Commission, he says, I am with you even to the end of the age. Like the work that we do, he's with us in it. And that's an awesome truth to cling to. It is. This one really spoke to me. The fourth one, if you lose the audience rejoicing with you, in other words, you're so alone. In yeah. I I know I have felt at times just I, I'm surrounded by wonderful coworkers co laborers but in terms of family friends whatever there are some things I do that yeah, they don't agree with. There's people that have blocked me on Facebook that are relatives, um, sure. and it that, that is heartbreaking. So if you lose the audience rejoicing with you, remember that millions of angels in the presence of God 
are rejoicing over each sinner who repents. You're not rejoicing alone. You're rejoicing with a heavenly host. And that is an awesome thought, you know, and they certainly take notice. If you feel alone and unnoticed, remember God sees and will reward you. Um, and Matthew 6, 4, when, he, when it says your charitable deed may be in secret, but your father sees in secret and will himself reward you openly. Yeah. Amen. So don't, you know, you, you probably will be alone and unnoticed sometimes. Um, your role may be seem insignificant, but there is no insignificant role in the eyes of God when it when it's yeah. for his glory. Amen. Um, if you feel your accomplishments are small and you're wasting your life, remember nothing in the Lord is ever wasted. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight ends knowing that your labor is not in vain in the yeah. Lord. You just have to know that. You won't feel it sometimes, but we need to know that. Our yeah. labor is yeah. not in vain. Amen. Um, rewards are eternal. And this one I thought was interesting because I had never really thought a lot about this, but greater sacrifice brings greater reward. Now, as I was thinking through that, I was thinking, well, I don't sacrifice in order to get a reward. I I don't think I do that. I think I sacrifice, if I do sacrifice, it's because I love God. Um, And I do try to keep my focus on it's for him, not that like I'll have a heavy crown of jewels when I, <laughs> yeah. when I get to heaven. But apparently, I mean, it, it does say in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it may not feel light, by the way, but it's just for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Yeah. When loneliness threatens to overwhelm, Never forget the promise of Jesus. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So those are, um, I think, some great uh, scriptures to to cling to as as you're struggling. Yeah, um, I agree. And and to remember that, um, you know, one day we're all gonna we're all gonna die. We're gonna leave yep. this this earthly life, and we're gonna be ushered in into the presence of the Lord. And I was thinking about that. I, I think everybody maybe does that now and then. Like, as you're standing there, the the first thing that you see, and it I'm going to start crying because it's so sweet. You're going to see Jesus first, I, yeah. I assume, with, yeah. <laughs> you know, saying, I hope well done, um, good and faithful servant. But what I picture because of where my life has been um, in the past many years is um a lineup of of babies. <laughs> yeah. And um and there will be some I'll recognize, you know, they that we knew that we right. knew were saved. But I'll bet the longer line are gonna be those ones that we don't recognize. We yeah. we never knew. We never yeah. knew. Yeah. And yeah. and that that they would um uh that they will thank us because we did see their value. We did love them and we we did mourn for yeah. those that we never um and for those that were not saved, but we spoke on their behalf, um, yeah. that there was. Yeah, some I mean, I think even them. beyond that, mm-hmm. people through um, who through our ministry and through that choice for life, and because of discipleship and and mentoring and churches pouring into these moms, come into the family of God. Yeah, you know, you think about it. That baby is raised by a mom that loves Jesus. That baby comes to know Jesus. That baby becomes a preacher or a pastor or whatever yeah. and leads people to the Lord. Yeah. The family is impacted because they see the impact that the gospel had on their daughter or their granddaughter or you know cousin or whatever. So many people that as a ripple effect from what you, Vicky, have been involved in, what you guys who are listening, what you've been involved in, that ripple effect and so many lives that are touched and saved, so many souls that were saved that you won't find out about until you stand before the Lord. We actually, that's one of the encouragements that I give that, and especially for you guys that are at abortion centers, reaching out where you don't see a whole lot of outward effect. You don't have a lot of interactions with people. I guarantee you there are babies that are being saved from moms that are just going, they're driving right on by because they prayed for a sign and you were there, you were that sign and they kept driving. And you're going to see when you stand before the Lord, that life, that baby that was saved, right? You you get to see that stuff. And so, as the Bible says, we walk by faith and not by sight. And we, we see what God's word says, these scriptures. And I want to encourage you guys to get this article. 
go on sidewalksforlife.com, go under equipping articles. I actually put that link in the show notes of all the podcast episodes so you can get the article. But there's a list of scriptures that we just talked about that Vicki just named out here um, that I think would be good for you guys to look at. Like, this is the truth of God's Word, and the truth of God's Word stands. Jesus said, the, he- the heavens and the earth pass away. My Word will remain. His Word is true no matter how we feel. And so is it worth it? It's worth it because His Word says it is. Yeah. Is He worth it? He's worth it. Because his word says that he is, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. so I want to encourage you guys, stand firm in what God has called you to. Push past the lies of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Focus on Jesus, and you know, it, it will all be worth it. It is all worth it. He is worth it. Uh, I want to encourage you guys, you can reach out to us. We'd love to just offer you guys some wisdom, some encouragement. And so you can reach me, Daniel, at lovelife.org. You can reach her, Vicky with a Y, at lovelife.org. Again, take advantage of this article on sidewalks the number four life.com. Um, also check out the podcast website, gospelcenteredprolife.com, where you can get all of our episodes. And until next time, God bless. God bless you all. Give me an outlet for love. Give me an outlet for gratitude. Nothing's too precious since I met you.